Well, good afternoon, everyone. As promised, I told you um, after you watched our interview last night, uh, I told you I was coming back today with uh, Dr. Knowles. I hope you got a chance to see that. If not, it is pinned to our pages. Um, what an amazing man. I am Dr. Jacqueline King, the CEO and founder of Black Women Empowered. And how are you doing today, Dr. Knowles? Dr. King, I am really, you know, I always say I'm very grateful. Uh, I've had ups and downs in my life, as most people have. Uh, as you know, two and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer, uh, recovered from that, got a knee replacement uh, this year, earlier this year, um, rehabbing from that. Uh, but tough times don't last. Tough people do. And I, I refuse to give up. There's no give up in me. That's, that's very inspiring. And, and that, that's got leading me right into my topic. So you, 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 you weren't born into a, a wealthy family, or were you? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, my dad, and I tell the story, you know, we were in Gaston, Alabama. That's where I was born. Uh, between Birmingham and Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains actually starts in Gaston. About 35, 40,000 people. Uh, my dad, uh, he tells this story. Uh, he made it to the third grade. Uh, the first day in the third grade, uh, the teacher didn't show up. The second day, the book still hadn't gotten there. And the third day, the school burned down. Uh, wow. that's, that's his story. Uh, but I don't believe that. I just think that was his story. But my mother, my mother on the other hand, uh, went to high school in Marion, Alabama with Coretta King and Andrew, Andrew Young's wife. They were both in the same class. Uh, my mother um, went to the 11th grade and then she moved uh, to Gaston, Alabama, but took up the torch of uh, desegregation and integration. You know, this little town in Marion, uh, T.D. Jakes is from there. Uh, you know, this is a very interesting town of black people and their leadership uh, that came out of that town. I never went to a black school growing up in Gaston, Alabama. Think about that now. I was born in 1952. That would have meant I went to elementary school around 1958, and I never went to a black school. George Wallace was the governor. A lot of us remember that name, so you can imagine what that was like. My dad made $30 a week as a truck driver. My mom made $3 a day as a colored maid. But what they did, their entrepreneurial spirit, my dad convinced the, the company where he worked to let him have the truck all the time. He would go and tear down the old houses and sell all the coppers and metals and wood, buy old used cars and sell all of the parts. My mom, on the other hand, convinced the white woman she worked with to also convince her friends as well, any hand-me-down clothes to give to her, regardless of what their sheets, you know, apparel, whatever it was. And on the weekend, my mother would make these beautiful quilts. So although they didn't make a lot in their daytime job, they did actually better on their evening jobs or weekend jobs where they used entrepreneurship as the core. Uh, so no, we I, I actually grew up Dr. King on the dirt road uh, with an outside bathroom, an outhouse. So I, I was far from growing up uh, uh, middle class or blue collar, white collar. I was far from that. I, I think the word now I've learned a new word called pink collar. Uh, oh. we, we were pink collar. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard the pink collar. And the reason I ask you that is because you're so successful and, and we're going to talk to our audience about, about what success means to you and how to get it. Because, 
you know, a lot of people use excuses. Uh, you know, my parents didn't have any money and this and that and that. So that's why I asked you that because I didn't think that you grew up with a silver spoon. So, but but you you had hardworking parents and they they had work ethics, which is really important. So that rubbed off on you. Is that correct? Absolutely. But but more than that, more than that, you know, there's determination and work ethics. That's one way. And then there's passion and work ethics. My parents were doing, because they were poor, they worked very, very hard because they were determined to make ends meet, as they used to say in the South. Um, what they gave me was the ability to do that I do now every day. I look out the window, I dream, I visual, visualize, uh, I am creative. They gave me that gift uh, to dream, uh, to dream big. My mother would always encourage me, you know, what, what is it you want to be? Uh, you can do that, son. My mother always encouraged, my father encouraged me as well. So so that's a crucial part is having parents who believe in you and encourage you and push you, right? So then there's no happenstance that Beyonce and Solange are really third generations because my grandfather on my mother's side, Dave Hoag, uh, I admired this man. This is like my idol when I was a kid. You know, he was tall, 6'6". Six, six. Uh, he didn't take any stuff from anyone. The first time I ever heard a white man say mister to a black man was to my grandfather. Uh, he was an entrepreneur as well. Entrepreneurship is generational in our family. Uh, so I, I really had those role models. Uh, those mentors, uh, one of the ministers in Gaston, Alabama, uh, Reverend Walker, uh, lived on the same street that I did. And he would stop by and talk to my parents and he would talk to me. So I had these black men in my life uh, that, that a lot of our young people to, today don't have. Yeah, I agree. Um... I agree 100%. So if you don't have um, a black father, a father that, you know, in your life, what, what's the alternative as a black man? What is your, what's your suggestion? Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm having a talk this week and I'm talking about mentorship and mentee. Uh, and, and what does that mean to be a mentee? Uh, it's sometimes a simple First of all, understanding and having some idea of what your goals and objectives are. What is it that you want to be? And finding someone that's doing that right now, seeking them out and asking. It's real simple. People think this is difficult. It's real simple when you ask someone and say, you know, I want to be the best salesperson. Would you, will you help me? It's as simple as that. So often it's right around you, help. It's asking for help. Uh, and there's these wonderful mothers. I mean, I talked about my father, but my mother was equally uh, instr instrumental in my life. So it's not just a male, female, it's parents. It can be either or, or both. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, for me, I always say that, yeah, you go, you ask a person to assist you. There are only two answers. There's yes or no. But no, in my opinion, is means next opportunity. Go to the next person. You don't quit because you got someone that doesn't want to help you. Would you agree? Well, I have another definition. You know, my background uh, is sales and marketing. Uh, did 20 years of that in corporate America. So my, uh, and I smile because I always said, if I got a no, that just simply meant I didn't explain it the right way. 
Okay. Uh, I, I never would accept a no. I'm going to go back. You say no, I'm coming back again, and I'm going to have a different explanation. I'm going to do different, more research and understand better. Uh, and if you say no the, the second time, I'm coming back the third time. That's that's the salesperson in you. Most of us don't have that, Doctor No. <laughs> kind of a no, kind of is like I'm not I'm not putting my feelings out there anymore. I already got this no. You know what I mean? Oh uh, yeah, mine's just like he said no. Oh no, 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 no. I, I, <laughs> obviously, I didn't explain that right. Let me go about it a different way. That's a that's a. That's great. I think that's great. I think that our audience could take that. I could take that too, because for me, if you said no, I'm going. I'm bye. <laughs> that, that's just the way it is. So now you, you're a father, and you're taking everything that you learn, and you're pouring it into your celebrity daughters, Beyonce and Salon. Um, so if our audience wants to know. Um, how to be successful and how to raise successful kids, what, what would you say? You know, I, uh, I always say this. I, I think a mistake that we often as parents make is we want to identify for our kids what they are going to be. I think that's a terrible, terrible mistake. I uh, taught now for 15 years and I'm, uh, occasionally and unfortunately often I get students who parents wanted them to be X and they wanted to be Y. That never works out. I think the role of a parent and the, the role I played and my former wife uh, who did an exceptional job played was to identify what was it that my kids were excited about. What was that thing that they were passionate about? What was that thing that they continually to talk about and identify that? I think the other role of a parent is to give your kids early. I'm talking four, five, six years old. Give them an array of things. For example, take them to the library. Let them understand science. Do science projects with them. Take them on a field trip. Let them understand uh, history. I, I let them I understand the various things in life they could be and just kind of, as a parent, be quiet and still and see what it is your kid loves and migrates to. They'll tell you. They'll tell you what they like. Uh, I never, it was okay with me, with, with Beyonce and Solange, whatever they would have said they wanted to be a hairstylist or if they said they wanted to be a doctor i would have supported that the one thing i would have done differently dr king uh, not done differently the one thing i would have done is i would have said in the example of a doctor go to medical school and when you get out i would have bought a hospital when my former wife said she was you know, she was tired of being a housewife. She wanted to build a career. And I said, what do you love? What are you passionate about? She said, I love doing hair and styles and fashion. I said, well, why don't you get your cosmetology license? And when you finish, we would have bought a hair salon. And, and so that's the entrepreneurial part in me. But I never said I want my kids to be this. I wanted them to find their passion. And, and another thing, while we're on that topic, I think parents have to understand the difference between their kids having a passion and their kids having a hobby. A hobby is when I have to tell you to go to practice. A passion is you tell me, hey, dad, I don't want to be late for practice. And we have to understand those differences. You know, it's funny you said that because my grandson, my son played football and, and basketball, and I know he got his son watching football at an early age, but his son played soccer. My son knew nothing about soccer. So he said, Mom, I had to learn soccer because he didn't want to play football. He wanted to play soccer. 
So it's, it's a perfect example, uh, you know, for what you just said. Uh, the other thing is, so what happens when you have single mom that she wants to do everything to empower her children? I mean, I know that I, I believe that I did as a single mom, but what advice can you give them if they're working like two and three jobs, the library and all that might not be an option for them? Yeah, it's, that's a difficult thing. I, I think the, the good thing about the difference of when my kids were growing up, we didn't have the technology that we have today. We didn't have the computers and we we're in first generation cell phones. And we, we didn't have iPads. We, we didn't have that technology. And I think that the uh, opportunity that today's single mom have is, is the technology that they can learn to share with their kids to get information. Yeah, that I, I agree. Everything is really, really at your fingertips. Um, and, you know, and I, like you said, you can find good, strong mentors, uh, mentors that, that can help your kids. That's one of the things that I, I did. I, I surrounded, uh, especially my son, around positive role models, you know, that, you know, could pour it. Cause I couldn't, as a mother, as a single mother, I couldn't, I couldn't give him the man stuff that he needed. That's impossible. So I, I made sure that he was involved with, you know, uh, friends of mine who were politicians or professionals or whatever. So that's, I think that's a good thing. So what defines success? You, you are so into everything, and you you said before we came on that you don't quit, and I and I I'm the same way. Um, so what drives you, and how does a person who's not driven get to that place? Well, let's let's answer the first one. Let's let's answer what drives me. Um, today, what drives me is so different than what drove me 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I was driven by number ones, being the number one sales rep, being having the uh, my artists winning Grammys and winning awards and having a number one album, record label being number one. That used to drive me 20 years ago. As I've gotten older, life changes. For me, what drives me is happiness. I'm going to be quiet on that because I want people to, to understand that. I work on happiness each and every day. And you have to work on it. The same energy I put on being the number one and winning all of these plaques and awards, I now put on happiness. I now put on lifestyle changes in healthy living and I have a wonderful, wonderful wife that I share who's also my best friend. Those are the things that are important to me today. Uh, to see my kids, uh, that they're healthy and that they're uh, enjoying life. Uh, it's not those things that I used to thought happiness was. And I think it's important for me to share that with folks. Right. And as we get older, of course, yeah, our priorities change. Uh, I I can relate to you. I was always um, competitive in the workplace. You know, I wanted to get, you know, the highest ratings. I wanted to get the best job. Yeah, right. So when you get older, yeah, you, you your your priorities and and uh, what's important to you definitely changes. Uh, so, how do people get to this success thing? Uh, you do a do you do a class on that? Do you coach on that? I you know I mentor, but I teach at uh, several universities: University of Houston, um, Prairie View A and M. I have a music business course. Uh, in Los Angeles, I literally next next week be in a classroom. Um, but more importantly, I, I'm a public speaker and I speak all over the world. I, I, I'll be in Australia today 
uh, oh, wow. doing, doing a lecture. I'll be in London tomorrow. Uh, but talking about the DNA of achievers, uh, talking about entrepreneurship, uh, talking about health and wellness, uh, those are some of my basic topics that I talk about. Um, talking about also as we are changing how the workplace is, uh, what type of workplace is a harmonized workplace that you or you or you're working in. Uh, those are the type of things and topics that I talk about today. So out of your book, and you have um, book one and book two, DNA of Achievers, right? Yes, we just came out with a special edition, added a hundred more pages. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, that was my first of uh, now five books, um, The DNA of Achiever. It's my, my bestseller as well, The Ten Traits of Highly Successful Professionals. And uh, during COVID, uh, I thought it was time to pick up the book, read it again. Um, and then I started thinking about the people because I interviewed a number of people in this book for each chapter. Unfortunately, four of them had died. Mm. Uh, and, and it made me realize that, uh, I needed to refresh that book, um, understand it and, and also give homage to, uh, some those people in the book who had passed away. Uh, one of COVID, um, you know, one of, of uh, uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, but I, I wanted to refresh the book. I wanted to hear some uh, thoughts of others and, and some younger uh, uh, people, some of their thoughts on, on topics like leadership, you know, passion, work ethics, how to build a team, uh, learning from failure. And uh, most of us don't understand and don't embrace failure. Often uh, when we fail, it should be an opportunity for us to grow from that, to learn from that, to become better. Uh, and a lot of people don't look at failure that way. I do. I, I always say, okay. Matter of fact, the, the thing that always makes people uh, kind of frown is with Destiny's Child, we used to practice failure. We, they would rehearse failure. They would go on the stage, they would do their normal practice, not knowing at any time the sound could go out, the lights could go out. We actually would do wardrobe things with buttons and shoes that the shoe might break so that they can be prepared for failure. Wow. That's that's pretty impressive. Uh, so, okay. So t first of all, tell how they can get the book. Cause I'm sure that plenty of people are thinking like, okay, I need this book. Well, you can find out a lot about me just simply by going to Matthew Uh, you can book me to speak there. It has the topics there. It has the five books there. Uh, certainly you can go to other uh, places to buy the book, Amazon and others. Uh, but the difference is, is that mine is a lower price and I'll sign the book and ship it back to you. Oh, that's nice. So your speaking engagements, where are some of the, I mean, do you speak, where do you speak other than Australia? <laughs> and, oh, uh, I mean, do you speak at church? Where, where do you speak? Some of the places you speak. I mean, it's, it varies. It, it varies. Organizations, meetings of organizations, uh, a lot of universities, uh, keynote speeches. Uh, it's, it varies. It varies. I've talked to Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I can go on and on. So if they wanted you like corporate America, see, for me, Right now, I came out of corporate America. I spent um, almost 27 years in the electric and gas industry, which is a hard, that's a hard industry, honestly, um, just because it's um, majority white male driven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what it is. Um, but thank God I survived. Do you go to corporations as I well? Do. And 
I, I, I do, especially in the areas of sales and marketing, marketing and leadership, uh, because that becomes a critical thing. You know, I uh, went back two years in a row, two summers in a row. I've, I've gone to, uh, to Harvard, attended Harvard as a student in their professional development uh, two summers ago, ethical leadership. So I do have a seminar based on ethical leadership. Uh, really, really enjoyed that, that course. Um, and, and so I can tailor uh, a seminar or a symposium or a keynote just based around the, the client. Uh, I've had so much experience, you know, being in corporate America myself, uh, building three businesses and selling them. Uh, so I've been gifted this opportunity to share you know, the successes and the failures and the pathway to success. There's a pathway to success. Absolutely. And, and being that, you know, your daughters and yourself are in entertainment, I know for a fact that um, you've dealt with some, some diversity issues. I have a background in diversity. Is that something that you train as well? I mean, it's so needed. I mean, just to me, just understanding and embracing different cultures to me is like we're moving away from that. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. It's called a harmonized, harmonized workplace versus a unified workplace. Uh, that's the title. Uh, and it talks about that diversity and what diversity is and, and what does that mean. Um, and I've added, because this past summer, I took cultural intelligence CV at Harvard, taught me a whole lot that we don't understand. Uh, in America, we are just so uncomfortable talking about different cultures the way that a black person approaches a problem and a way that a Asian American approaches a problem and a way that a white American approaches a problem is different and it's based on our culture. And we should embrace that. Instead, we try to force everybody in the workplace to do it this way versus embracing that, oh, there's a different way that I haven't thought about to do this. We need to do more of that in America. We are so uncomfortable. I'm a black man. I do things differently than a white man. I'm not shy or embarrassed about that. I do, I'm all day working with white men. We do it differently. I look at them like, why the hell you do it that way? That's the hard way. And they might look at things I do and ask us and say the same thing. We are culturally different. Thus, we approach everything in our life differently. And that's not a negative. That's not a, a throw down on any other culture, culture. That's just saying, hey, let me understand your culture. I'll give you an example. You go into a store and you buy a coat. And the lady says to you, oh, that coat doesn't look right on you. Now, some people would think, oh, she's saying that coat is too big, right? When in fact, that's not what she was saying because in her, her culture, she was saying that it was too small. Hmm. And, and I, we had example after example. Uh, you know, one of the examples, just to show the differences in culture, uh, it, one ex uh, example was if we were on a boat and the boat was uh, sinking and there was a mother, father, and two kids, and unfortunately, unfortunately, someone had to get off the boat so that the boat wouldn't sink, who would it be? In Asian culture, it would be the kids because the parents are the most important. In American culture, it would be the parents. We're culturally different. So I talk about that. And, and that, that is true. Um, 
but when I was working in um, diversity, here's what I, I also saw, is if you take a piece of that culture and a piece of this culture and piece it all together, a lot of times you can come up with really good solutions. Did you find that? Well, it's like a beautiful quilt. I mean, that's what a quilt is. Exactly. And you're absolutely correct. Um, but we have to take the first step in understanding and embracing, first understanding the other cultures and how they work and how they think and uh, what the things that are important to them. Um, you know, it just takes that effort that we're, we're still in America so uncomfortable. You know, we, you know, I still see black people, whenever they say white people, they got to whisper, oh, it was white people. Why, why you got to whisper white people? Why the heck do you have to whisper when you say white people? We still got a lot of that that we got to get out of us. I don't, you know, at, 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 at Sony Music, we used to have meetings and it, it would be, well, the pop department and the urban department. And I would say, look, that's full of BS. Let's stop calling it that. Let's call it what it is. When you're saying pop, you're talking to white. And when you're saying urban, you're saying black. And they changed. They got comfortable with saying that. The black music and, the, you know, it, it, let's talk about it. Let's stop hiding it. Let's stop feeling uncomfortable about race and, and, and culture. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree a thousand percent. Um, sometimes I feel like we've come a long way, but it seems like we might be digressing now, uh, you know, with with uh, races and stuff. And I, I, I'm like, wh where's all this coming from? Um, well, it's very clear where it's coming from. I mean, uh, it's very clear. And I said this years and years ago when this social media thing started, that that would be the downfall, uh, and especially a lot of our black children. Um, and, and that has become a real challenge. I was just watching CNN last night, and it was talking about Facebook and how they identify pre-teenagers. I mean, these, these companies have identified our, our young people and, and how to take them down the wrong path. Uh, and parents need to understand that. Uh, our kids spend over, two, pick up a phone over 2,000 times a day. That's a tremendous amount of, amount of hours that our kids are just picking up a phone. Our kids now have lost self-esteem because of the word light. You know, now you can just hit a button, light. The people don't even respond now when you say, hey, uh, did you see the game? Light. <laughs> There's no conversation. You know, we, we're such into a, a light uh, world now. Everybody's trying to be light. Uh, nobody has self-worth. Uh, most people aren't building a self-worth and an identity for themselves. They're, they're going to social media for that. And this whole thing about where we are with the, the vaccination. You know, a lot of that is coming from social media, not understanding that other countries, uh, they want us, they want us to fail. You know, when the presidential election, it was proven the Russians, who did they pick to go on social media to do the Jedi mind trick? Black people. Well, yeah, and and even even with the politicians, they do the same thing. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so we have to we have to have our use our own minds and 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 research our research for ourselves to know. I mean, uh, it's it's to me. There's a lot of adults that are on social media, and they stay on. I know you see it. They stay on social media. I think you froze for a minute there, Dr. King. Are you still with us? I 
Are you still with us? I, I think you were still here. Still? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know. I think, it, yeah. So I think that adults too um, are, are getting lost in the social media thing, uh, you know, on there all day long, you know, liking, posting, whatever. Um, so it's not just the kids. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, I don't know. You asked a question um, that I, you know, I'm sure I know. I, I don't know. The people I know, they don't spend time on social media. None of the people that I know do that. Successful people don't do that. It's just not something we have so many hours in a day is how can we maximize the day how can we spend time for ourselves and our family? I don't want to, I, I would care less about going on social media. Um, and, and, you know, I was, uh, Nikki Giovanni uh, spoke at Prairie View, and she started out her conversation. There's a lot of fools out there, and we can't help them all. And, and that's a fact. We can't help all the people. We just stay steadfast in our belief. Uh, those that want to get help, that want to uh, uh, desire to be better, uh, those that aspire to be better, uh, want to learn more, they'll, they'll come. And there'll be many that want. And we have to continue our focus on the positive. And that's, that's why you're here, because you are an inspiration, and that's what we do. We try to bring people on that are inspiring, encouraging, and uplifting. Um, Dr. Knows, you are, to me, it's always a blessing to be with you. Um, one more time before we leave, tell them how they can book you, give your website, any Twitter, whatever you want to give, share with our audience, please. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. King. It's always a pleasure. Uh, I always learn from you, and, and I we just have a conversation, and that's what I enjoy. Uh, yes, sir. You know, I always say that in my vulnerability uh, lies my safety. So when I when I do teach or uh, give a speech or presentation, uh, often it's just from my heart, and, and it's from life experiences, and and I share not just the positives, but the things that didn't go well, because everything is not always good in our lives. That's why I love uh, um, that chapter is one chapter that, that I, I really like in, in the DNA of Achievers. Of course, I knew I wrote it. Uh, and, I, and I, you know, failure is an opportunity to grow and not a reason to quit. And, and I, I live by that motto. Uh, but if you want to understand and know what I'm doing, it's simple. You just go to MatthewKnowles.com and it tells the events that I'm that are upcoming uh, that are upcoming that I'll be speaking at. It'll tell you how to book me to speak, uh, all the topics. Uh, it'll tell you all of my social media handles. Uh, social media for me is just giving information. Um, it's not for me. I don't use it in a personal way. I use it in an informative messaging. Um, that's how I use social media. Uh, so I am on social media giving information. Uh, so it's, it's again, simple as going to MatthewKnowles.com. But I'd be remiss if I just didn't end this with, it's real important. We still have a ton of people who have not gotten vaccinated. And yeah. I, for one, would love to go back to normal. Uh, and, and I'm going to wear a mask when required, and I'm not going to even hesitate. Uh, I'm fortunate I've gotten both of my, my Moderna shots. I've gotten my, my third Moderna booster shot. Uh, and, it's, and, and it's just a plea, a plea to those to understand as a a trickle effect of not getting vaccinated. And that is your chances of, of being sick are high. Your chances of being sick and dying are high. Your chance of getting other people sick are high. The chances of 
my daughters going back to normal and having concerts, uh, they are affected by this. The chances of me public speaking on a stage, I'm affected financially by this. And there's many, many, many people affected in so many ways because simply somebody don't want to get a vaccine. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to say this. Your show will be the first I said it, and I've thought about this. A lot of it has to do with fear. No one said this. I'm going to be one of the first probably to say it. It's the fear of getting a shot. Nobody said that. I'm going to say it. We made a mistake in showing on TV over and over again people getting shot. Imagine the people that have been traumatized by needles. I'm, I'm traumatized to go to the dentist. There's a lot of people traumatized. So let's admit it. Some of you, it's as simple as you just are frightened to get a shot. Go and get the vaccine. It takes two seconds. You barely feel it. I had to say that. I had to say No, I, I thank you for saying that. And I agree. I agree 1,000%. Someone said to me uh, the other day that, uh, you know, you don't know what's in this vaccine. You don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. And that's why I won't get it because I, 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 you don't know what the long-term effects. I said, okay, well, think about this. I may not know what the long-term effects may be, but I know what the short-term is if I don't get it. I have a very high risk of dying. <laughs> and I said, and there's no coming back. <laughs> you know, you can't come back and say, I wish I got the shot. You, you've seen the people that are on life support saying, oh, give me the shot. It's too late. It's too late. It and, and, too and, you know, late. I've heard many people say exactly that, Dr. King. You know, I don't know what's in it. And, and they have a, a, a soda or a iced tea or a glass of wine, and I'm saying, what's in that? Or they're eating a meal, and I'm saying, what's in that? Or they said, oh, I, I took uh, three aspirins. Uh, I took my medication. What's in that? You know, let's, let's not use that as an excuse because you don't, and we don't know what's in a lot of things. What I do know is that there's too many black people involved with this science for it to be a conspiracy. One of the top leaders in this vaccine is a black woman. There's too many black doctors that would let this be a conspiracy. It's too many of us. Absolutely. And if this is a conspiracy and black people will allow this to be a conspiracy, it's a wrap, because if they allow this to be a conspiracy, it's going to be some real bad stuff happen. But that's not going to happen, and it's not happening. It's fear now, uh, fear and political. You know, we still have the political side that still believe everything that man said. I won't even say his name. And well, and then the other part. I'm glad you brought this up. The other part is. Uh, you know, you, you hear the church people, you know, I'm going to go there. My pastor said, you know, we don't have faith if we, if we, uh, you know, just believe in God. Do you know how many, and I don't know if this is an accurate count, but at one time there was 30 bishops in the church of God in Christ, which is my grandfather pastor that alone that died from COVID. 30. Yeah, I, I did read that. Um, and, and, you know, look, I, I believe in faith. I, I, I'm not a advocate of religion, uh, because there's many of them, but I believe anyone that has faith and whatever your faith is, I support that. I don't support the thought that one is better than the other, as long as we have faith. Uh, but I believe in science. I, my 20 years in diagnostic was in diagnostic imaging, selling MRI and CT scanners, and being, mm. a neuro, being a neurosurgical specialist and selling mammography equipment. Uh, I understand science. I've seen it uh, on a daily basis uh, in an operating room or in radiology. Um, it's a factual thing. 
and I, I'm saddened when uh, we convince people that their faith alone, and, and that's not just this vaccine. This goes deeper in a black community as, for example, in breast cancer, um, black women, uh, mortality rate is significantly higher than their white counterparts. When we look at overall, the mortality rate, the death rate of black men in overall diseases, based on the percentage of black men we have in America, we lead in every category of death. We lead in every category of death except breast cancer and suicide. And a lot of that is because of early detection, lack of early detection. And in a lot of cases, the belief that something or someone else can save them other than science, which is grossly untrue. You, you know, it's faith, but you have to do the, the early detection. You have to do the, the science part of it, in my opinion. That's that's my opinion. No, I I agree. And, and even the Bible says, my people perish from the lack of knowledge. And if you're not, you know, accepting the knowledge of the science, then you are really setting yourself up for failure. I am so glad that you brought this up. I have talked about this before, but um, not this extensively. And I do have friends who say they're not getting the vac vaccination. They know this and that. And all I can do is say, well, you know, then deal with the consequences. What can I, what can I say? You know, I'm, I'm okay. If somebody doesn't want to get the vaccine, I'm at this place now. I'm actually okay. That's your right that you have. Uh, that's your belief. But let's put those people all in an area so it don't affect, all those, together. So, so it don't affect those of us that do. So it doesn't affect that I have to wear a mask. It doesn't affect that I can't do certain things uh, for entertainment or for livelihood. Don't let it affect me. It's okay if you don't want to do that, but it's affecting other people. That's the part I have a problem with. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I like that. And yeah, that would be nice. But anyway, I know you got to go. I thank you so much. Um, again, I'll put your website on our um, pages so that the people, and we've gotten, I'm looking at the comments. The people who are commenting are, is very positive. They said they really enjoyed it. Um, thank you for your information. Uh, so until the next time, until you get me, I'm still waiting on um, an interview with Solange. <laughs> I didn't hear back from you on that. I'm still waiting. I tell you, that's Solange. She's a moving target, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but God bless you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Knowles. And um, you take care of yourself. Safe travels, okay? All right. Thank you, Dr. King. Have a great day. Thank you.